Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and a few years ago, I released a no-talking version of a video where I restored my childhood BB gun. However, after it was up for about a week, YouTube flagged it and said that I demonstrated the use of firearms in an unsafe manner and completely shelved the video. However, I liked the project so much that I'm bringing it back. I've added additional footage, additional scenes. I've also added commentary so people actually know what's happening, and I've really stepped my safety game up. Range is hot. So this is the jumping off point of the restoration. This is my Daisy BB gun I was given when I was eight. A lot of people refer to it as a Red Rider. Occasionally, if I don't think someone looks very smart, I will also tell them it's a Red Rider because that stupid movie ruined it for everybody. But a Red Rider was a classless BB gun. It had that big engraving on the stock that looked gaudy. The Daisy BB gun is pure class, as you can see, but I'm gonna be replacing some of these cheaper plastic parts with some really cool metal parts giving everything a total overhaul. And also when I was in high school and I really didn't know what I was doing, I gave it kind of a mini restoration where I spray painted the barrel, stained the stock with some like Minwax cheap, terrible stain. And so I'm gonna be removing all of that and starting fresh and making it even better. Since I spray painted the barrel in high school, the first thing that needed to be removed is the paint. And this is my favorite way to remove paint from a kind of delicate curved surface. This is stripper from Home Depot. And this is not the toxic stripper your dad warned you about, but this one is just as damaging. You can see I brush it on there and in just a few seconds of sitting there, the paint curdles up like milk left in the sun. It is pretty brutal, nasty stuff. So make sure you wear your gloves, your goggles, all that PPE. It is really, really effective, but again, pretty toxic stuff. After I'd spent about an hour splashing paint stripper onto my forearms, I decided it was probably clean enough. And despite the fact that this steel is 30 plus years old now, it's actually in really good shape. I gave it a quick refresh with some 4 aught steel wool. Then on a few of the rougher areas with some scratches, I got this 2000 grit sandpaper and just kind of smoothed it out. And this is because I'm going to be using a bluing solution. So it's not going to be like a paint on the surface. It's going to be the actual steel. It's just gonna be kind of a cool blue black oxidized look. So you need all the steel to look really, really clean because that's how it's gonna look when it's finished. Everybody knows that woodworkers hoard way too much wood that they'll never actually use, but this is why everybody is wrong. This is an old offcut of an English walnut black walnut graft piece, which if you don't know what it is, it's super cool. They plant a black walnut tree because the roots do better in the soil, I believe. And then they graft an English walnut tree to it. So the English walnut are the walnuts that actually grow. And if you are wondering what it looks like, it looks like two different trees grafted together. It's a really crazy process. And what's even crazier is how the wood looks right at that seam. And that's where that light wood meets the dark wood. And also, I might have it backwards. Maybe they plant English walnuts and then graft black walnuts to it. One way or the other, it's two different trees and it looks really cool and it makes the wood look even cooler. And that's what I'm gonna be using for the gun stock. It's right at that graph section where the English walnut meets the black. It's just the craziest, coolest marbled section and it's gonna look freaking cool, especially for a BB gun. If this wasn't clear from the start, I've never done anything like this before and everything I'm doing here, I was essentially learning on the fly. And for copying the stock, I thought it would be a little bit easier if I made a plywood copy of the original stock and then transferred that plywood copy over to this new English walnut stock or the graph stock, I guess I should call it. And to do this, I'm using double-sided tape. This is just my go-to 3M. They call it permanent double-sided tape, even though it's not permanent. If you get the temporary stuff, it'll fall right off. So make sure you get the permanent stuff. And this is my router table and just a template or a flush trim bit. And I was actually pleased with how well this worked. There's gonna be a fair amount of hand shaping that I'm gonna have to do, but this did a really nice job of getting pretty much a rough copy of the original stock. If you've ever watched a video on YouTube of someone restoring their childhood BB gun and thought, this is absolutely fascinating, I need to try this myself, but how does one get started restoring their own childhood BB gun? Well, I've got great news for you. I've got a three hour virtual workshop on restoring your very own I'm just kidding. I do not have a virtual workshop on restoring your own childhood BB gun. However, I do have a virtual workshop on building your own epoxy table, which I feel like will be much more applicable to most of you out there. It is over three hours of content. I go through absolutely every single step to build a wood and epoxy table in your home shop or garage. And if you are interested in avoiding all the pitfalls and disasters and mistakes that I've made over the years building epoxy tables, there's a link in the video description with more information on that virtual epoxy workshop. 
Of all the tools when I started woodworking, I bet I was the most intimidated of the router and the router table. It's something about a bit spinning at 20,000 RPMs just an inch away from your fingers that is a little bit unsettling. I would say now I'm pretty comfortable with it and it's a very, very useful tool. If you don't have a flush trim bit like this, make it one of the first few bits you get. You can see got essentially a perfect two dimensional copy of that original gun stock and we'll work on that third dimension here in a little bit, but now I'm gonna cut the foregrip. And for this one, I didn't bother copying the original one because it was essentially just a square rectangle piece of wood. Getting that kind of barrel concave section to it is gonna be a little tricky, but we'll worry about that in the future. These next couple parts were pretty tricky. I needed to cut the little recess that that lever sits in when it's closed. And to do that, I got a straight bit and I just kind of notched it out until it fit just right. And then I got my original stock and found out what radius it was. And luckily for me, it was a pretty standard radius. I believe it was a three quarter inch radius. So I just got my three quarter inch bit and started slowly curving away at that surface. And the bottom side though, that was gonna be a little bit trickier because I needed to get the full curve so I needed to stand it up on its edge, which probably isn't the safest way to do it. Eventually I came up with a little bit safer way. I clamped it to this two by four, which made it a bit more stable, or I should say a lot more stable. And this enabled me to get that full three quarter inch curve down there on the underside. And now it was really starting to look pretty close to that original BB gun stock. Since I actually did this restoration a couple of years ago, as I'm doing the voiceover here, I'm watching the video and I'm wondering why exactly I didn't bring that router radius all the way to the end. And I think I actually remember now my high school shop teacher, he told us that we could never go all the way through the end of a piece of wood with that router saying that we risk blowing out the grain and that can happen, but I've learned some ways now to kind of mitigate and really eliminate the risk of that altogether. But this was Mr. Valiotis's West Albany high school shop lessons really sticking with me and the rasp was use, useful for fitting it to this metal section because you see there I had that kind of weird fit that I do and this just took a lot of trial and error and this is not something I'm particularly skilled at but in the end I think it was probably good enough for a factory daisy bb gun job anyway. After I had everything fitting together pretty well, I went through my final sanding process and this is gonna be my daily driver BB gun. However, I did sand up to 400 grit, which is a little higher than I would normally go if I wanted to maximize protection for those wind and rain sessions. And this is the lever and this is gonna be the coolest BB gun lever I have ever seen. And I would venture to say anybody's ever seen. This is a piece of Damascus that I bought on Etsy. It wasn't particularly expensive. I think it was like, I don't know, 20 bucks or something like that. You can get all kinds of different patterns and I'm definitely not a metal worker, but I have a few metal working tools and this is my little cutoff wheel and my cheap vise that I have there. And I'm just gonna try to cut this into the same pattern as that original lever, which was a little bit difficult for a guy like me without much skill or tools, but I love this grinding wheel that I have here. It's pretty similar to one that like a knife maker might have and did a really nice job at smoothing out these edges. Some of you watching are probably wondering, why does a cheap BB gun from the 80s really merit a custom Damascus lever anyway? And I would argue for the same reason someone might ask, why put a smile on the Mona Lisa to mask how truly average she really is? Now, if you are the type of viewer that doesn't care for YouTubers comparing their BB gun projects to priceless works of art or belittling women that died 500 years ago, I might not be the channel for you. However, if you are one of the people that can see the humor in belittling a woman that died 500 years ago or comparing a 80s BB gun restoration to one of the greatest works of art of all time, I think I might be the channel for you and I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button. When I was building this project, I actually had no idea how a BB gun functioned and if I'm being honest, I still have absolutely no idea how an air gun works, but I figured if I used the factory parts and made a lever that looked exactly like the original one, it should still be able to technically cock and fire a BB, but I didn't actually know if this would work or not. So I installed it with that factory hardware and decided to give it kind of a gentle pull, but it didn't want to move. And I really didn't want to break this because I'm pretty sure the inside of these are all plastic and this Damascus lever would just tear right through them. So got this back to the vise and went back to work, just kind of smoothing out some of those bits. 
There were a few trips to the vise and back to the BB gun and then back to the vise and back to the BB gun, but eventually I got it hooked up, gave it a gentle cock, and it actually worked, and I was pumped, if you couldn't tell. I decided to do a quick test fit of all the parts to ensure that everything fits together absolutely perfectly, or should probably say fits together as well as it did from the factory anyway, and these are the original screws, however, I'm going to be restoring those as well to make sure that there's a little bit of continuity and everything looks just nice and new in the end. The way I'm going to attempt to cut this slot in the lever is I'm going to drill a couple of small pilot holes, I'm going to come back with a large bit, and this should give me a nice consistent radius at the front and the back, and then in theory all I got to do is connect the two of them with my cutoff wheel, but I didn't mention it before, don't exactly know what I'm doing as evidenced by that drill press almost killing me right there. But we made it through and now I got it back in my vise, got my cutoff wheel, and for once I'm actually wearing my PPE. I tend to wear more PPE when I'm less sure of what I'm doing. I've seen too many of those Instagram videos with one of these cutoff wheels embedded in someone's face shield or safety glasses. I feel like even when I was doing this, I knew that there had to be a better way, but for some reason getting this done fast was more important than getting it done right. And that cut right there is the end result of getting it done fast versus getting it done right. And maybe someday I'll have some actual skills or better yet, a plasma CNC that can just cut this out perfectly. But for now, or at least for then, I'm going to have to rely on my not so steady hand and mediocre metal files to smooth everything out. And this did take quite a while, but eventually I got it somewhat resembling that factory shape. In the last couple of years since I originally finished this stock, I've learned a lot about wood finishing and learned about some better products and some worse products. And this isn't the worst product out there. However, it's probably not the best either. I moved on to using Rubio a lot. This one gave me more sheen than the Rubio, which is why I used it originally. But I did some tests on it and the protection really just wasn't there. And there's also been a lot of technological advancements in wood finishing since this video came out. And so what you'll see at the end of this video, I actually end up adding a N3 nano finish to it, which will not just improve the sheen, but also really improve the protection. So maybe you finished a piece of furniture a few years ago with a finish that you don't think is the best one today. You can add the N3 to it and really get that protection, bump up the sheen and the contrast. Just improves everything about basically all wood finishes. And if you want my advice on the finish I would use now, I like Rubio, it takes a long time to cure. and. The best one, my favorite one right now, is a vesting LED oil. It basically cures in seconds instead of weeks like this Osmo or the Rubio. So vesting LED is probably my number one choice. Any of them, though, would benefit from the N3 Nano over the top of it. Refinishing the metal might have been my favorite part of the entire project. This is called Perma Blue. It's a cold bluing solution. And I'm not a cold bluing expert, but I did a little bit of research leading up to this. And here's what I found is... You need to wipe everything down with acetone. Everything has to be absolutely sterile. If there's any oils from your hands or anything like that, this bluing solution won't penetrate and it'll leave like a thumbprint there. So make sure everything is very, very clean. Then you just take like an old rag or a t-shirt and you wipe this bluing solution on and it instantly starts to oxidize the metal. And that's what's happening. It's actually oxidizing it. So it will, in theory, inhibit the rust later as, as I understand it. But please, some gunmetal expert out there, correct me on that if I'm wrong. After it sits on there for like a minute or so, the longer you do it, the darker it'll get. You rinse it off with cold water, let it dry, and then you come back with the steel wool and you just kind of buff it out. It leaves kind of an oxidized chalky residue on the surface, but that steel wool buffs it out really quickly and that's what you're left with. And I think it looks freaking awesome. A little bit better than that original spray paint that was on there. Uh, I also used that bluing solution on some of the factory hardware. However, some of these screws were a little too stripped out, so they've been replaced with other ones, but all of them will have that really cool gunmetal factory look. And I tried the bluing on this Damascus, but it did not work at all, and so went down a little bit of a rabbit hole and learned there's a lot more to getting that Damascus look than just putting some of the bluing solution on there. What I'm doing here is called acid etching, and I'm using muriatic acid. It's an acid you can get from like a pool supply store, and I believe what's happening is it is actually eating away at certain parts of the steel more than others, and what results is that really cool Damascus pattern, and you put it in the baking soda bath there. After you remove it, you can see that Damascus again where you couldn't see it before it went in, and I'm told from some knife guy that this is a way to really highlight that etch, and this is just cheap coffee, put it in there about as strong as you can make it, and then you just let the Damascus sit in there for an hour, and what results is an even darker etch. 
If there is one type of comment that I look forward to more than any other type of comment on these restoration type videos, it's the person that informs me that I have actually, in fact, not restored this and instead have modified it, therefore destroying any of the value that it would have once held. And they act like by me restoring a $20 plastic BB gun from the 80s that I've swapped a Plymouth Prowler engine into a 62 Ferrari, but I would love to know what would the original factory value have been, that original blue book versus what it is now with all these aftermarket parts. And I can tell you, it's probably nothing. It was worth nothing before, it's worth nothing now. It's my childhood BB gun, I'm having a little bit of fun with it, so you can share your grievances at your next toy swap meet, but I'm enjoying this. It had been about three years since I'd originally finished this BB gun. You can see in the background, it's looking a little dull. And this is the N3 Nano I told you about earlier. This is a nano coating that actually works fantastic on wood and metal surfaces. And it's not any type of build. It's not like putting a lacquer over it. You absolutely cannot see it. It is micron thin, but it gives you so much protection. So if you had a real rifle that you actually take hunting, I would 100% put this on all of the wood and metal surfaces. And I'd mentioned earlier that YouTube had demonetized this video because of my dangerous use of firearms. So this time, when I'm gonna demonstrate it, I'm gonna be excessively safe. Range is hot. Did you get it? Yes. Okay, I can't see shit. How many shots do you think it'll take? Uh, I bet you'll do it in like four. Challenge, Challenge accepted. Ready? Yes. Wow. -hoo 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 -hoo. That was not camera work either. Although I probably would have still staged it to make it look that way. That way. Think you can do it again? You ever hear stopping all your head, Scott? No. Me neither. Well, let's go. Keep going. Keep. Keep okay. Ah. Uh, uh, I would like YouTube to take notice of the safety going back on, and here's how we started. And here's how it ended up. And every week I like to give a little credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with the words safety first. YouTube, you're hearing that? Safety first. And I will know you made it all the way to the end of the video and I'll do my best to respond to all of your questions and comments first. Have a great week.